Good evening, right? Amen. Great evening to listen to Barb Zafaris talk about charting the life course. Before we do that, uh, just some general housekeeping stuff. Um, we're going to cut the light as soon as we get started. Right outside of this door is a drinking fountain. If you exit this door and make a left, you'll find the restrooms as well. I'll kind of be positioned over there if you have any questions about that. Okay? So with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Barb. Barb Zafaris. Hi, everyone. Hi. What a beautiful day, huh? I live north of Cleveland, and it was just, I was like, oh my gosh, sun all the way down. It was awesome. So we need to enjoy this weather. Um, thanks for having me. How many of you have uh, people you love who are adults that receive services? Anybody with children? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> new, new information. Oops, a secret just got revealed. Uh, my name is Barb Ferris. I worked for Cuyahoga County Board for 36 years before I retired. Um, my background is as a speech language pathologist, but I also worked as an SSA. Um, and you'll hear more about my family. I am also a family member. I'm a sibling, and you'll see some pictures of my family in a little bit. I'm here to talk about charting the life course. I know some of you have been leaping through the PowerPoints, but how many of you have heard of charting the life course before today? Okay, all right, good, good. Well, charting the life course is a set of tools and a, an approach um, to support people with disabilities and families and professionals to think about life in a different way. So I know you've had ISPs, and I know people have said we're going to be person-centered, and these are the tools today. I'll cover three tools before we leave at 6.30 that you can use to think about planning and life and the kind of life we want for the people we love. This is all part of a community of practice. So community of practice is a group of people who believe in something, use the tools, and learn from each other. Ohio is part of that community. And we, I have a, another sign-in sheet, but I didn't ask you to sign it when you walked in because there's a column here that says COP. Ohio is part of a national community of practice using life course tools. And if you want to be part of an email list to hear how people are using the tools, uh, we meet quarterly. At the the uh, meetings in Columbus are Facebook Live, so if you can't drive to Columbus, you can also watch it on Facebook and see how people are using the tools, how they're using to change lives. So uh, this is part of a grant, and I need an attendance sheet for the grant. So if you could just put your name, if you want to be added to an email list to find out more and know when the meetings are, check off yes under COP, Community of Practice, and put your email address so you can get the emails. And I appreciate that. So we are part of, I think there's about 20 or 30 states that you are using Charming the Life course. It is a project that is funded in Ohio by the Department of Developmental Disabilities. The tools were developed nationally by a group of families, people receiving supports, professionals, and you see the partners up here. So not only professional organizations and parent organizations, but also the Sibling Leadership Network, which is a group of, for adults who have brothers and sisters with disabilities, because oftentimes we are very active in supporting our brothers and sisters. Sometimes they like that, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, as all brothers and sisters do, right? <laughs> um, in Ohio, the Department of Developmental Disabilities wants families and self-advocates to know about charting the life course so that they are empowered to share information and understand what the professionals are saying to them. I work for Ohio State University, OH. I was going to say, come on. <laughs> come on, come on. And um, the other partner is the University of Cincinnati. So here's a little bit about me. I'm the oldest of three. Two years after I was born, my brother Jim was born. Two years later, Nick was born. Nick was diagnosed when he was six months old with a developmental disability. 
And I love this picture of us with Santa Claus because, <laughs> as you can see, as the oldest, I was always told what? Take, you're the big sister. Take care of your little brothers. And I am holding on to Jim, who looks scared to death. I mean, I am, he is clutching me. I just think it's, what a picture. And of course, Nick wants nothing to do with Santa. But my parents always, we always did things as a family. If one kid went, everybody went, including to the doctor, which I really did not appreciate when I wasn't sick. You see the middle picture. <laughs> it was like a field trip. We're all going to the doctors. I don't want to go. I'm not sick. It doesn't matter. Your brother is. Um, when Nick, when I turned 16, what did I do? When Jim turned 16, what did he do? When Nick turned 16, what did he tell us he wanted to do? He wanted to drive. And I was like, I don't think so. What, how is that going to happen? And one day Jim said, we're going to make it happen. Because what do families do? They think about possibilities and they push to see what can happen. So my mother never drove. Jim and I as teenagers, my mother was a single mom. We had bought a car, a Volkswagen. One day Jim said, Nick's going to drive. I said, are you, what are you thinking? That's not going to happen. Pulled the car out, put Nick in the driver's seat. You see the key is in the ignition, which we had to put his hand on the steering wheel. We tried very hard to put his hand on the gear shift. It would not stay. But we took the pictures. This was when, before digital, took him to the drugstore, had them uh, developed. Showed them to my mother, and you can just imagine her reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were smart. What kind of sister are you? I said, Mom, the car did not move. But it was very important we put the key in the ignition, and it was very important that he wore a cool jacket and sunglasses. Jim's like, he's got to wear sunglasses. If you drive, you've got to wear sunglasses. I say that because... We need to push the people we love to do the things that the other kids do, okay? I knew that car wasn't going to move, but when Nick was dying, he said to me, do you have the pictures of me driving, sis? I want to show staff. I said, you know the car did not move. He goes, I don't care. I want to show staff. And so I found them and showed them. In the top right, one of Nick's um, dreams and outcomes was to go on vacation. And staff said, we'll help you go. We, all sorts of groups go. And my brother proudly said, I don't want to go with anybody else. I want to go alone. And so that picture is when the provider supported him. It took him three years to save the money, buy the ticket. Um, and he went to Disney. Why he wanted to go to Disney, I have no stinking clue. Because we are not a Disney family, but that's where he wanted to go. When he got back, he said, I want to go on another trip. Let's plan it. I was like, oh my gosh, what did we start here? But anyway, what do we all do? How many of us want to go on vacation? Yellow. I wish. <laughs> I want to get out of the snow. So I am one of four ambassadors in Ohio, um, which means that I can share the tools, life course, with people, with professionals. You need to know that all the SSAs in Stark County, unless they were hired in the last couple months, <laughs> have also been trained to use the life course tools. So hopefully, you'll be able to have some conversation with your SSA and they'll know what you're talking about. And hopefully, they can guide you to use the tools. The tools got developed because a group, as I said before, of families, people with disabilities, and professionals met at Wayne Spread, which is a, um, a, like a retreat center in Wisconsin. And they talked about what do families need? What would be helpful for families? And what they said was we need to have uh, a more unified group of families working together. We need to be able to share with each other and learn from each other. And we need to impact policies that affect the people we love. And boy, that holds true now. Um, lots of things are occurring at the policy level. I hope you all get not only information from Stark, but I hope you all belong to the DODD family chat or family listserv so you get information about what's happening at the state level and also at the federal level that affects the people we love. 
So the community of practice says we want all people, and this means all people. These tools are not just for people with DD. I have a 93-year-old mother. I'm using these with her as we plan how she wants to live and what she wants to do as we work with the aging system. But we want all people to have a life. They have the right to live, learn, work, and play and pursue their aspirations. So as families and as a professional, I always help people identify goals. And usually the goals started with improve, right? Increase skills, improve. And what we want to change the dialogue, change the narrative to what kind of life do people really want? So I'm active in the Sibling Leadership Network nationally. I meet siblings from all over the world. And if I ask them, tell me about your brother or sister, they use the same phrase. If I ask parents, they, ask, they use the same sentence. Here's the sentence. I have a son, daughter, brother, sister who is, they tell me what? Oh, come on. You say it too. What do they tell you? Me. Yes, who is disabled. They tell me what? Their age. You know, I have a brother or sister who is so many years old has, start labeling the disabilities, then what do they tell me? Where the person lives and what they do during the day. They go to the workshop, they have a job, blah, 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 blah. And what do they never say? The person's name. And I usually have to say, and their name is. We as families have been taught to use the disability narrative. We describe the people we love with the disability language. How many of you would, I would not want to be introduced as a slightly overweight Greek American woman that wears bifocals. <laughs> if somebody introduced me that way, that would be the last time probably I would talk to them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't you dare say it. <laughs> And yet, that's the way families typically talk about the people they love. We need to change the narrative and talk about who is this person. And these tools will help us when we sit with people who are supporting us, whether it's a team, whether it's one person, because remember, we can speak up anytime we want. It doesn't have to be a meeting. So one of the things that, that we learn is that most of the people in the United States with developmental disabilities are not known to the DD system. Usually it's less than 50%, actually it's 25% nationally. In Ohio it's about 40, uh, 51%, it's about 50%. So there's still 50% people out there with developmental disabilities that are not known to any county board of the state. And what we're talking about is this is how we should talk about all people. So whether a ch I've talked to parents of young children under three, and they're like, really, should I be talking like this? I said, don't you have dreams for your child? Every parent has dreams when they have a child, right? Doesn't matter how old they are. So yes, yeah, start talking about your dreams and what you want for your child. What's a good life? What we've typically seen is that services, do we have a laser pointer? We do. We, have, we typically have seen that services wrap around the person and not necessarily around the family. And what we want to realize is that all of us exist within the context of family, whether that's blood relatives or friends or whoever you call family. Okay, I grew up in a very ethnic community I'm related to people, I have no clue why I'm related to people, but my mother tells me, call them aunt and uncle, they're your, your relatives. Okay, so who knows, but they're, you know, that's the way it is. We want to make sure that services do not disconnect people from their families, and we want to make sure that services are provided in an integrated fashion to support the family and look at the community. So what does that mean for us as families? That means that everything may not come from the DD system. It means we have to look at who we know, what's available for any citizen in our community, and start looking for support from them. But it also means we don't want our 
brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters to be segregated from everybody else in the community by the services. So everyone exists within their family. And some people, and you may have relatives, there are some people who care about people, but don't ask them to provide that daily support, whatever that looks like. I'll help you in other ways. I'll, I'll give you money, I'll drive, but don't ask me to do that day-to-day -day stuff. I know in my family, Jim had a different relationship with Nick than I did, okay? He was the brother, he was the goofball, he wrestled with him, he, but if he had to do something every day, that wasn't quite his, uh, his comfort level. So maybe you and your family, maybe in, in your family, maybe you're the caring for person. You, can, you provide that daily support, but other people may provide that caring about in another way. And we need to realize that everyone has their own comfort level. It's whatever works for us. But the outcome is we want people to have a good life. So what does a good life mean? We want people to have control over their life. That's self-determination. I have yet to meet anyone in my 40 plus years that cannot tell us what they want and what they don't want, whether they use words or not. People make it very clear to us what they like, what they don't like, what they want, what they don't want. We want people to be seen as productive, we want people to be integrated, and we want them to be included. We also want families to be supported. Is that, yeah, my sign-in sheet? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we also want families to be supported. When Nick was diagnosed at six months of age, my mother said that within a month we had people coming to the home, into our home, and teaching my parents how to handle Nick, how to do exercises. That was 1958. They were not there to support his sister who was four and a half or his brother who was two. They were there to support Nick. We need to step back now and say what does the family need so that they can exist and support the person they love versus just what does the person need. And that's the um, I don't know how many of you have been around in the service system, but a lot of families, including mine, was told just what? Just put them away and forget about them because it will impact the rest of your family. In other words, separate him from the rest of the family. When I talk to families, what really bothers me is that even fam parents of young children have been told that. And I'm amazed that people are still being told that. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about parents that have kids under 10 are being told by the medical professional, just put them somewhere. You have other kids to take care of. I'm amazed. I'm just appalled. We need to start looking at what does a family need. What we learned at Wayne Spread was that families usually need three things, and we call it the three buckets. Don't ask me why. We need information about the disability. And most families, that first bucket will tell me, I don't want to be trained, and I agree. We don't need to be trained. We need the information and the help. We're not professionals. But we, we need that information about what does the disability mean? What, are, um, what, what is the impact? We also need to connect with other people who have lived the life. So I want to be able to talk to other family members to find out how they're going through it. And it could be face-to-face, -face. it could be, are, are any of you part of virtual groups? I'm part of a, a couple of listservs that are closed on Facebook that are only for adults who have brothers and sisters with disabilities. Because why? We have a different perspective and we want a place where we can safely share those good, bad, and ugly stories, you know, because not everybody, we love our brothers and sisters, but we may not like them every day. And I'm sure some of all of you who are brothers and sisters feel the same way, okay? So we, are, we can connect to each other on Facebook. And the other thing we need to know is what's out there. What's out there that can help us? What are those services? 
So I, I'm not going to go over these, but here's some examples of what those three buckets really look like. One, I see that Stark has a navigation tool now, and that probably includes information about services and supports and ways for families to connect. Okay, okay, so you've got a tool that's local. There's also a statewide website, you can look at that. And at, on Ohio State's uh, website, there's the uh, Family Resource Network, and there's information on there. There is lots of information on the internet. I hope you're all using the internet. But one of the first things that we need to start thinking about is what is a good life? And this is called the trajectory. So I am going to give every person a folder, I'm just going to hand them, and if you could just take one, everybody, there's enough for everybody to have a folder. There are a couple different, excuse me, a couple of different colors, everybody can take a folder. Um, and there's lots of resources. The first sheet in your folder is an evaluation form, if you could fill that up before you leave about the presentation and leave it, I'd appreciate it. But what we need to look at is what makes a good life. So what makes a good life for any of us? And don't use general terms. What makes a good life for you? For me, what makes a good life is that I have my own home. What makes a good life for any of you? Ah, somebody yell it out. Good, good health. Good health, absolutely. What else? Yes. Yes, knowing you can pay your bills and oh my gosh, uh, you know, I can get what I need and maybe have some for the wants. <laughs> what else? What makes a good life? Know your love. Okay, to be right, because what's the number one human need? To be loved. Yes, somebody raised. Yes. Well, the sick of my son, he's disability, he's working towards things and he's accomplishing. Nice, nice. So a good life is also when you have a goal and the support to reach it, right? That right. people believe in you. Yes. Okay? Like believing that Nick could drive. Eh, I wasn't quite there. Jim was there. I was not. <laughs> okay? So a good life. What are the things that you don't want? Those things down in the bottom cloud. Yes? Refusing to live in Ooh. Okay, so refusing to live an unlived life. So what does that mean? You don't want to do what? I want to be more independent as possible. Okay. So I would be less or completely away than I could do by myself without help. Okay. 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 And that's awesome. Let me just remind let me just remind everybody in this room that none of us is truly independent. None of us. Okay, none of us. None of us is independent. How many of you made your own clothes? Grow your own food? Made your car? Built your house? None of us is independent. We depend on others, but how do we get what we want and need? With money. You pay them. That's right. That's right. And we all need people to help us. Okay? I don't cut my own grass. I don't fix my car. The only thing I know about a car is how to write the check or sign the credit card for getting it fixed. I do not know anything about a car. But I have the money to pay someone to help me. And that's what we need to realize is we, none of us is independent. So often, we have told people like my brother and like the people I worked with that they need to be more independent. And, and, and sometimes my brother would say, sis, why do they keep saying that I can't do that? Physically, I can't do that. Don't they know I tried? And I was like, Nick, just let them say it. We'll just you know, work with them. Yeah, it is a, it's a meeting, let them write it, we'll be done. <laughs> They'll learn. <laughs> but, you know, so, and so we have to realize that our approach should be what help do people need so that they can live in their own apartment or get a job or 
get to see their friends? What help do they need? Same with my 93-year-old mother. I would never tell her she's not independent. Because <laughs> she would tell me what I could do. But, <laughs> but I have to keep thinking what would make life easier for her and what help does she need so that she feels good about herself and there's dignity in the support she gets. So let me tell you what I've heard um, families say. Siblings, when I say, what do you want for your brother or sister? What's a good life? They want them to have somebody who loves them other than their family. They want them to want have... To okay. Yes, yes. Not that the only people that love them is not just their mother and father and sister or brother but someone else, just like we all want to be loved, right? They want, um, this one struck me, they want enough room for their stuff because their brother or sister lives in a home with other people and they don't have room to keep their stuff. So their stuff is often at their brother or sister's or parent's house. They want something to do during the day that's meaningful. They want their brother or sister to be seen as somebody who can do things. Um, and what's it? Oh, they want them to have friends, not to be lonely. So in the bottom is what they don't want is people to their brothers or sisters to be lonely. They also want them to have good medical care by doctors who know about working with people with disabilities. So. But isn't that what we all want? You told me you wanted good health, you wanted to be loved, um, and that's what we all want. So when your SSA is meeting with you and says, what are your outcomes, we need to stop thinking about improving skills, but what kind of life do we want for the people we love? And if you can't think of what the life is, then think about what are your worst nightmares. And what are your nightmares? You don't want the person you love to be what? Lonely, and what else? Number two. Yes, yes, absolutely. Universal across families. When I ask self-advocates, what don't you want? <laughs> I love it. I've, I've done this with about, I was trying to count today, and Josh asked me, have you done this with other groups of self-advocates? I've done this with about 500 people who receive supports in Ohio. And what they all, universally, I can bet my condo on this, universally what they don't want is drama. And when I asked them what's drama, they said, you know, those people I live with or go to day program, they make such a fuss over everything. And I'm like, okay, okay. And the other thing that's been universally said is I don't want people bossing me around all day. And I said, you got to tell your SSA that. Because if you don't want to be bossed around all day, then let's see how maybe you don't have to have staff telling you all the time. Is there another way to support you other than staff telling you? I use my phone. I use technology. I don't want people telling me, did you remember to do this? Because I'm going to smack them. <laughs> I don't care if I love them or not. If they keep reminding me, they're probably going to get hurt. Because then my thought is, do you think I don't have a brain in my head? So can we use technology or other systems to remind people? And I, as a speech pathologist, I'm telling you, I've used pictures, I've used symbols, I've used drawings, and I don't draw. And yet the people I worked with somehow, if I told them this is what the picture meant, they knew what they they could understand it and use it. So we want people to have better lives, not just better paper. We want people, a good life is that we have what's important to us. And I don't mean likes and preferences because if I ask people in Ohio or I've asked in other states, what are the top three things that show up on ISPs that people like? What are they? No matter where in the United States I ask, people with disabilities all have the same three or four top likes. What are they? Shopping at? Walmart or the dollar store. Going out to eat where? Mickey D's. Yes. What's the third one? 
Going what? Bowling. Okay? And what I say to people is, so how come of the thousands and thousands of people receiving services, those come up as the top three on plans? If there's any other group in the United States that would be defined by the same three likes, we would probably say they're in a cult. So we need to make sure people have a broader life experience than shopping at Walmart, eating at Mickey D's, and going bowling. Because that does not, none of you mentioned any of those three as a good life for yourself. We need to start thinking about what makes a good life. And listed here in person-centered, oh, I should also tell you I'm a person-centered thinking trainer. And I have worked with the SSAs in Star County. So they've all been trained. Um, but what we talk about is what's important to people is that they have people they want to be with. So relationships. And we shouldn't see generalizations on the plans. Don't say family, because I am sure all of you do not like everyone in your family equally. There are certain people that you are very close to and certain people that it's like, yeah, once a year, please, that's it. So who are those people that you're very close to or your son or daughter are close to? Status and control. Nick wanted to drive. Why? Because 16-year-olds drive. Okay, that's status. Some people's status means having a key to the house. Don't we all carry those keys around? Okay, or the code to get in to, through the garage or wherever. Uh, some people have those. Uh, things to do and places to go. What's important to people? Rituals and routines and rhythm and pace. That would be how many of you are morning people? I am. How many of you are night people? Oh, gosh. Oh my gosh, sometimes I don't even see night, you know? Because <laughs> I'm such a morning person. And things to have. What are those important things that we want in our life? The other thing is important for, so in your ISP meetings, I am sure the SSA has asked you what's important to you, to your family or to your, the person you love, and let's get beyond McDonald's, Walmart, and bowling. But we also talk about important four, and those are health and safety. Because you know we're all mandated. Anybody that's helping you is mandated to ensure health and safety or make sure we address health and safety. Um, the, oh, I missed a slide. OK, the other thing that's important for people is that people are seen as valued contributing citizens. So what does that mean? We need to start thinking about how can we help the people we love be seen as a valued citizen? And we're all seen as valued citizens because we share our gifts. And our gifts are our gifts of our mind, the knowledge we have. I know people who know every stat of every uh, Cleveland team, uh, and that is their gift. They know the sports information. I know people who know every plane that's ever been flown. And I just go, oh, OK, that's very nice. It's not me. Uh, people who know everything about certain groups, rock groups or music groups, that is their gift of their mind. Gift of the heart. For me, I am amazed at how loving my brother Nick was, someone who needed total support, and yet he was such a kind, gentle man. And gifts of the hand. People, you know, what are their, your talents? What are the talents that our family members have? Some people are phenomenal artists. They write. It's just incredible. How are we helping people use those gifts and be around people who value those gifts? So stop thinking about, um, we need to start thinking about roles people have, not activities they're in. So I know a woman who, every year with her church, for 20-some years, she has gone to Nicaragua as part of a mission team. And I asked her, what do you do when you go there? She goes, oh, I've built walls, I've painted, I take care of the children. And I said, so you're a missionary? She goes, a what? Uh, no, she says, I go to Nicaragua every year. I said, you're a missionary. You see the difference between the activity and the role. I said, you're a builder? She goes, I'm not a builder. I said, you just told me you built walls. I can't build walls. She goes, oh yeah, build walls. 
I paint, and she paints walls. I said, do you paint? She goes, yeah, and I had a pancake breakfast at my church to raise money, and I made the centerpieces, and she pulls out her phone and showed me the centerpieces. They were gorgeous. I said, you're an artist. She goes, I'm a, no, I made centerpieces. I said, no, you're an artist. So maybe we need to change our language, too. A discrete skill is not a discrete skill. It's a talent. It's a, it, what role do people have? So we can help them share that role. So these are the areas of life when we talk about what kind of life do you want. They don't necessarily line up with the areas on your ISP, but you can see how closely they're related. And the one that I talk when I talk to family is always look at this one. Citizenship and advocacy. What valued roles does your family member have? Do they volunteer? Do they do stuff at church? I have found out talking to people, they sing in choir, they usher, they pass out programs. But when you ask them, do you volunteer, they can't, they have no clue what I'm talking about. So what rules do people have? And as family members, think about with your other children. You found ways for them to be active and do things. How can we find ways for um, our brothers and sisters, sons and daughters with disabilities to also have roles. We also want to support people to make choices in their life. I'm not saying they're going to make every decision, but you know, how many of you raised ch children? How did you teach them about money? You gave them what? Allowance. And you had to bite your lip when they wanted to buy something that you knew was probably not the best choice, and then they were going to run out of money and not have money for the rest of the week. And so you told them, if you spend it now, you can't buy anything out, no more candy for the rest of the week till you get your allowance. And what did we have to do? Let them make those mistakes, right? So I'm not saying put people at risk, but sometimes you just got to let people make those mistakes so they learn to make choices. And setting goals. Nick had a goal, he wanted to go to Disney. Took him three years to plan it and save the money and do everything. And I supported him and was like, is this really gonna happen? And then I'd be like, oh sure Nick, yeah, okay, it'll work. And thinking, oh my gosh, how is this gonna work? <laughs> and then the other thing we need to do is, we call it anticipatory, um, uh, anticipatory guidance. If somebody wants a job, when did you get your first paying job? At 22, when you graduated from college, or? No, heck no. When did you get your first paid job? 16. 16. Any of you babysit, deliver the paper? Yep. So you were not 16, you were probably, <laughs> what, young, right? Yeah, I think about 12. I guess. 12, exactly, exactly. So what are we doing with our, brother, our, our family members, the people we love with disabilities? They don't get their first job at 22. We didn't get our first job at 22. And before we babysat and delivered the paper, what were we doing? Chores, yes, hello. <laughs> Chores around the house, okay? I mean, how many fights occurred in families over who was going to wash the dishes versus dry the dishes? Oh my gosh, or clean the table, oh geez. So start expecting, start putting those expectations. What can people do? And, the, and why do we do that? Because we all have roles in our family. And people with disabilities should not get a pass on that. There's something they can do. So I tell people this, there's some people in the room who knew my brother, so okay, here's true confessions. We did not have, we, had, we my mother was a single mom, and uh, we, um, Nick's job was, he was the shopping cart when we went grocery shopping because we lived like a mile from the grocery store. So his wheelchair became our grocery cart. Did I say that in public? <laughs> <laughs> Because it was on wheels, okay? So we take Nick to the grocery store and hang the milk. And obviously, we never gave him the eggs because with his spasms and his, uh, uh, the eggs would probably land on the sidewalk. But that was his job. Nick, we're going shopping. 
you didn't have a choice. You're going shopping with me, Nick, because we got to buy food and we need more than one bag. So as family members, we need to look at and we need to articulate this in our teens. What is a good life? So in your packet, in your packet, you have something called a portfolio. What I want you to do, you don't have time now because I want to get you out at 630. For your next meeting, start looking at what is your life, what life outcomes do you want for your son or daughter? What do they want? It may not match. Big surprise, right? Just like my, my, I wanted to go to college. My mother said, girls don't go to college. I said, I want to go to college. She said, girls don't go to college. I said, I want to go to college, okay? So my vision, my mother's vision did not match, okay? Um, but start thinking about this. Have these conversations. What's a good life? And you can see some of the common answers up there. And across the bottom, you see the lifespan. Because even a mom of a little toddler, if um, one mother told me she wants her daughter to have friends that don't have disabilities, and so as the school is talking to her about things, she's saying, you're not putting my child with other kids. How is she going to meet kids? And so she's articulating that vision now. I want my child to be with other students who don't have disabilities. Thank you. Start thinking about what that good life is. Oops. Thank you. So they had bets on how many times I was going to walk in front of the light. They didn't bet on how many times I was going to drop the clicker. <laughs> the other tool in your packet in the portfolio on the back is called an integrated star. So you can use this when you identify an outcome. So throw out an outcome for me. Uh, somebody wants a job. Let's do a job. In the middle, in the star, you would write whatever the outcome is. And then start looking at the five areas of support. So if somebody wants a job, what personal strengths do they need to have? You can identify the, what they need and what they have. If somebody wants a job, if you're trying to help your son or daughter get a job, what skills do they need? What strengths do they need? Uh-oh. They need to work with others. They, okay, good. They need to work with others. What else? Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. What else? They gotta want to work, right? They gotta have some kind of work ethic. Uh, maybe they need to be able to ride a bus. And if you start writing those things, if anybody wants a job, what do they need? You start writing them down and it can help you identify what they can do and what they may need to work on or get support for. Over here would be who can help them. So if they want a job, um, I, I was talking to a family last week that they wanted, I said, what does work mean to your son? And she said, doing something where you can talk to people about sports. So I said, okay, who do you know? Oops, I'm sorry. Who, who do you know right now that can help you find that kind of job? Do you know anybody at church that works in sports? Do you have neighbors? Are there any sports memorabilia shops near you? Is there a sporting goods store? Do you know anybody? Because most of us got our first jobs, why? Somebody we knew, yeah. right. We didn't go through a job coach. Go ahead. I was just going to say that. Good. Thank you. I hope you're coming to one of the sessions on March 8th. <laughs> so you can be in the group with lots of other people, too. Then we don't want to go to eligibility specific. Up here, technology. What technology can help you get a job? Yes? There's a vast array of technology that can help you, which would be one of the the internet we can make the big one. Absolutely. Uh, message, uh, message board. Yes, yes. Uh, 
newspaper ads. Okay, so some people look online for the newspaper ads. Some some communities have a local TV station that runs job postings. I don't know if Star County has that, right? but. Uh, Their local stations do run like job postings. Well, this is actually in the high school. Ah, okay. Okay, so using the internet, um, uh, tablets, uh, smartphones, all sorts of technology, including alarm clocks, right? You gotta get up to go to work, right? Stuff. So think low tech. So do, do you know how to use it? Or is that something you need to work on? And then community-based. Where can you look for jobs in the community? On the internet, those are the companies that Yeah, you can walk down the street and look at, there's a whole lot of stores looking for people now, which is kind of, yeah, absolutely. But walking around your own neighborhood so that you don't have to worry about public transportation. Are there any people with help wanted uh, signs in their store? Um, uh, going to message boards at your community center, sometimes there's job postings. There are even job postings in my church. People will post, I'm looking for a babysitter, I'm looking for somebody to help here. And then down here is eligibility specific, which would be your county board and uh, opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities. Ooh. So that's a second tool. The first one is to think about what kind of life you want. Use that trajectory. Who can help you? Look at the integrated star. It can be for anything. And then the third tool is a one-page description. So I told you we need to change the narrative of how we talk about the people we love and not use the disability narrative, but use the human narrative. When we talk about people, our friends, we talk about what we like about them, okay? We don't talk about that they're overweight and wear bifocals. We talk about what's important to them, and for when you're talking about getting help, how could you best support? So those are the three areas of a one-page description. I put Nick's up here. Um, Nick the Greek, yes. Nick always wanted to be called Nick the Greek. On his grave, on the stone, he told my mother he wanted Nick the Greek on the stone. One day, and he's, he's buried in Canton, because that's where my mom's from. And uh, somebody walked past the grave and saw her in church in Canton one day and said, I didn't know you were related to the gambler. And my mother said, what? <laughs> and, she said, and the woman said, you're related to Nick the Greek, the gambler. And she goes, that's my son. He's not a gambler. So oh, it makes for a little uh, confusion. <laughs> but you see, the great things about Nick, he was intuitive. He had a sense of humor, trustworthy, loving, caring, devoted, honest. Those are the words we need to start using, the qualities that we love about the people we love. Important too, every night, Nick and I would chat online at 8 p.m. When he died, I said that at his wake and, or funeral, I can't remember where, and one of the staff who was his favorite said to me, oh my gosh, I would be feeding him ice cream and at 10 to 8, his watch would beep, and he would back away and go to his bedroom. And she said, I never knew why. And I'd be like, Nick, you don't want your ice cream? You're, le you're leaving me? You don't like me anymore? I said, I like you even more now because you didn't ask him and you didn't press it. He was going to get ready to get online. Why? Because he didn't like, he liked privacy, and he didn't want anyone to hear our conversations. And the only way he could talk on the phone is if someone dialed and held the phone. And so we chatted online because he had a computer, he had the internet, and he could type with me. Um, going to family events, privacy, time alone at home, and our Greek tradition and culture. <coughs> so that would be, people have used the one-page profile. 
Sometimes that some county boards develop them during the ISP process. Yes or no? Some uh, counties are using different ones they write for job seekers because what's important to them or how to support them on a job would be different than general information. Now, no matter how many assessments you would do, unless I told you, you would not know to feed Nick on the left side of his mouth with a spoon. And I'm a speech pathologist, and I know how to assess feeding. Oh, not my favorite. But that's what we knew as a family, and because of Nick telling us, this works best. So what are those things that you want people to know that they would not figure out themselves? And it would make a better life for someone. So sometimes it's don't tell them to do something, ask them. Okay, duh, how many of us don't want to be told? But if someone asks us, we're much more receptive. Um, don't read over his shoulder. Oh, he hated when people would talk to him, hi Nick, and he'd be like, do they know I'm old enough to be their father? And I'd be like, yeah, okay, don't use that, pers pa uh, that uh, parent voice. And how to put him in bed. And you think that those are things that would come out, but they really aren't. They're what the family knows. So think about what you know and is nowhere on paper. And you need to start writing that down. Because that's what makes a good life, is people know what to do without causing stress on the person. So in your book, in your folder, I gave you a booklet. I gave you the one-page profile, the star, and the trajectory. I also gave you a booklet from um, University, of Kansas, uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, and charting the life course. There's all sorts of information in there. And can I show people this out of your thing? Mm -hmm. Also, if you want to think about this anticipatory guidance, what do we need to look at? So for safety and security, did we consider a home security alarm system? Do, do they know their address? Do they carry the information? Do they know how to get in the house? This is stuff we do with all children, not just people with disability, okay? So can we use technology and instead of always looking for staffing? Is there any technology that can help? And so under each area of life, is the areas of life are on the left <laughs> and across the top are the five areas of support from the integrated star and some prompts to make you think about what's possible inside the booklet there's also more prompts things to think about so use the resources um, if you have any questions i will stay i see it 6 30 if you would be kind enough to give me feedback on the eval. It is two-sided. I would appreciate it. Can you see how you might use this information to prep for your meetings and your conversations? Some families have made one-page profiles and given them to the providers that come to your home or the day providers. One county board, when they are closing their day programs and the um, individuals were going to different providers, wrote a one-page description and gave it to the new provider. They said, we knew these people for 20 years. Why are we going to make the new provider have to learn about them? Let's write down what we know and give it to them. Some people have written a one-page profile for jobs with, and give it to their employer when they interview. Some people have written a one-page profile and given it to providers when they interview them. This is who I am. Can you help me? Um, oh, one mom wrote a one-page profile for her young son for medical appointments. And the medical, and it said how to best support us. When we come to the office, take us immediately back to a room. Don't ask my son to take off his headphones. Don't tell him it won't hurt. And make sure you face him when you talk to him. Now, nowhere did she list his disability, which some of you could guess is what? Autism. autism. Right. Because if a doctor sees autism, they're not going to know. I better put you in a room. My staff better put you in a room right away because you don't like sitting in the waiting room. The doctor may not know. Don't tell him to take off the heads, the uh, earbuds. Um, but if you 
if you are very specific, the staff, and the staff loved it. They were like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Um, some people have written in when people are hospitalized or go to respite because they want somebody to know what to do. Some people have written them and put it in with their important papers. So if anything happens to them, that information is somewhere that someone can find it. So I thank you for your attention. It is 6.32. I kept you two minutes later, three minutes late. <laughs> but use it. And if you have any questions, I think my email is on the handout. Please don't hesitate. If it's not, come up and ask me. I'll give you my email. If there's, oh yeah, it is on one of the slides. Um, I'm more than happy to help you, and uh, good luck using them. And if you've joined the community of practice, you'll start getting emails about meetings, and let us know when you use them. Tell us how, how they worked. So thank you very much. Anything else? And you can download all the tools for free on lifetools.org or .com. <sighs> okay. Okay. Thank you to Barb. Um, I do want to remind people, if you pick one of these up, great, but if you didn't, make sure to pick one up on the way out. It's the flyer for the uh, Life Course Training for Self-Advocates on March 8th, and there are going to be two sessions coming up. Anything you want to say about that to describe it? Um, what we'll all do is I will actually have the self-advocates write on their portfolio and start writing things down, and I'll ask the staff to come with them to start. If somebody says, I don't want drama, I'm going to ask staff, write that down, so that, you, and I'm going to give them a folder. The reason I gave you a folder is when you come to meetings, what do staff hand you? Lots of what? Paper. Paper. Well, I gave you a folder so that when you go to meetings or when you're sitting and talking to somebody, you have a folder of paper, and you can open it and say, wait a minute, let's talk about what our vision is. Let's talk about... Um, what, service, what uh, resources might be available. We overload you with paper, you start using the paper with us. Okay, is that? Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again to Barb. Stick around if you have any questions. Yes, yes. And if you're headed out, uh, have a safe drive home. Thanks everybody. Okay. Sure. Barb, where do you want the vowels? David, are you coming on March 8th? A lot of the day programs are going to, I think. Uh, that's I'll that's that's okay, well, I know who do you work with at Excel? Do you work with? Oh, what? really? Barb Young. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I know the people who own Excel. <laughs> so tell them to come. <laughs> Hey, I actually work at Jackson location. Okay, so what do you do there? We make